Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey everyone, welcome to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. This is a project that I've been brainstorming and procrastinating for months, and we're finally going to make it happen. Um, The idea of this podcast is we're going to try to put out one per month, and we're going to recap and reminisce and synthesize different chess books. Um, Of course, I'm gratuitous, I mean, uh, blatantly stealing this idea from some other podcast that I like. Uh, I'm going to give them a shout out here just for the record, uh, Overdue, which uh, summarizes fiction books, Animal Spirits Rekindled, which is a fun finance podcast that um, occasionally does a feature where they rekindle uh, some finance and behavioral economics classics. And of course, uh, the Ringer Network's Recapables, where they do the same with music. I mean, with movies. So that's the uh, vibe we're going for here. I think it'll be fun. I'm also hoping it'll have um, a bit more of a chess improvement theme, even more than regular perpetual chess interviews. Uh, I'm hoping to have a rotating cast of guest hosts, and I'm excited to introduce today's in a moment. Um, And just to tie a bow on this, the goals for this podcast are to entertain and help you improve at chess for this type of podcast, to introduce you to a book you might want to read or refresh your memory about a classic if you've already read it, as I'm sure some of you will have, uh, to expand the perpetual chess empire, very important. And again, my plan is I'm going to try to do about six of these at least over the next six months. And then I'm going to study the download numbers, study the Patreon donations, um, study the feedback. I might even venture into the YouTube comments, although that's always dangerous. And then I'll see if I can keep it going, see if it's feasible. But I'm really excited. This is the most excited I've been about a new project since I started this actual podcast. Okay. Um, Oh, and uh, with guest hosts, um, uh, again, we'll get to ours in a minute, Um, but... I'll be looking for qualified guest hosts. So I'm going to have a page where if you're interested, you can submit uh, your name. If you know me, that's great. If you don't, that's fine too. Obviously, it'd be great if you speak English and you have a headset or mic and you're willing to do the work, but this will even pay a little bit. Although today's guest is generously going to select a chess charity instead to put the money towards. Um, But anyway, you get the idea. So without further ado, oh, no. But still no introduction. Sorry, guys. Um, very last thing. I also wanted to mention that another way to support the podcast, I don't mention this much, but we have affiliate links. Um, I have through Amazon in the US, as some of you might have seen with the book, might have seen with the book links. I also set up a chess.com affiliate account. So if anyone listening is not a chess.com paying member and you're joining and you click on one of the links in the show description, I get a little kickback. Uh, and with Forward Chess, who um, has a great library online and a great way to read chess books on a tablet. So I'll have links to those periodically. I uh, just wanted to have full disclosure on that. Um, we are a mom and pop podcast business. Okay, now on to our great guest. So I'm super excited. Once I had this project hatched, obviously, I needed to um, think of potential guests. And Um, My guest today is someone I know a little bit, but of course, I'm more familiar with his work. He's been putting out great YouTube videos. He really, really knows his chess. Uh, That much is obvious. He's a USCF master. He is the director of international content for chess.com. He is a dad, a small business owner. Uh, You should definitely be checking out his YouTube videos. Sam Copeland. Sam, are you still there? Yes, it's a pleasure to be here, Ben. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting to talk chess and Mikhail Tao with you. Yeah, awesome. And when when I reached out to Sam, I told him about the idea and I suggested um, I had maybe one book in mind that I'm sure we'll get to sooner or later. But then Sam said, I have a handful of suggestions. And we settled from amongst his suggestions on one that was, of course, already on my list. But who knows when I'll get to the any of the 60 plus books that I have listed that would be good candidates for this project. Um, obviously, obviously not every chess book is going to be great for an audio only recap. A tactics puzzle book isn't going to work so well with that, but ones with recollections and actionable chess advice will. And Sam, 
why did you suggest uh, the life and games of Mikhail Tal? Uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think that for me, game collections have been one of my absolute favorite ways to enjoy chess. I always uh, enjoy uh, reading about chess, but I especially enjoy the game collections in terms of the inspiration that you get, getting to know a great player a little bit better, and getting to get into their head in the games and understand what they were thinking, what they may have completely missed. Um, with this particular collection from Mikhail Tao, I think that Tao is just incredibly open about um, not just the chess that he's playing, but also his psychological state and what's going on in his life in lots of ways. And I really, really love that. Um, for me, books have always been a huge part of the game. It's kind of weird to say this because I grew up in the U.S. and South Carolina, but for me, South Carolina was kind of a chess desert when I grew up. Like, I didn't get to find a rated tournament until I was like 15, maybe 16. Um, there was like one club that was like three guys, and I didn't find that until I was like 13. And chess books were the way that I got into chess. The library had like 100, and I read all of them, but it was always the game collections that were my favorites. And this one, I think, is the best game collection that there is in terms of an autobiography from a great player. Yeah, and you're not alone in that opinion, that's for sure. I mean, we've had many perpetual chess guests recommend this book, of course, going all the way back to I Am David Proust, Pascal Charbonneau, Michael Agner, Doug Griffin, R.B. Ramesh, and then, of course, um, in the Reviews I've read of the life and games of Mikhail Tal. Uh, Mary Chandler said it's the best chess book ever written. Uh, legendary writer Jeremy Silman only said it's perhaps the best chess book ever written. But you guys get the idea. I also have to make, uh, while we're gushing over this book, I have to make the uh, confession that I actually hadn't read this book before we before we got into this project. Obviously, I knew it's a glaring omission. Everyone has that like movie that they haven't seen that that people are like, "What you you haven't seen this movie?" And this was that book for me. This was that chess book that it's somewhat shameful um, <laughs> that I had not read it. But obviously, that gave me um, even more impetus to have this be the the book that we're going to talk about and recap. Um, so the next thing I just want to get out of the way, just to give a little more color, is we're always going to do a little about the author feature. So obviously, Mikhail Tal, um, you guys, if you're listening, you probably know a thing or two about Mikhail Tal. And we're going to be spending the bulk of this uh, little podcast talking about him. So we'll just give the broadest brushstrokes. Um, he's eighth world champion. He was the youngest world champion in history when he Won the ti when he won the title, that record was subsequently broken by Garry Kasparov. Um, he, of course, is known as the magician from Riga. Um, as Sam was saying, just a legendary personality. Uh, perhaps um, it seems like he was maybe the most loved world champion. So that's basically what... I mean, obviously, we'll be getting more into uh, Mikhail Tal as we go on. But uh, this book has a co-author who doesn't get as much... Um, as much... Uh, mention uh, uh his name is Yakov Damsky or Domsky probably he um he's left a big mark as a journalist he was a Russian reporter announcer uh, he helped run tournaments he was good friends with Tal he was a candidate master and in addition to my life in games he helped Tal with some other books and he co-wrote Kramnik my life in games and the art of defense in chess with Lev Pulagayevsky uh many others and go I go. would like to mention that one of my uh favorite books uh by Domsky is Chess Brilliancy, which is just a collection of brilliant uh, games, largely brilliancy prize winners. Uh, much of the collection is uh, the informant best game winners, but that was a book I got in like high school, and that was the first thing I think I'd read by Domsky, and I absolutely love it. It's maybe got some quibbles regarding the analysis, but you will not find a better collection of amazing games. Oh, wow. And uh, that's a big memory for me. I remember a lot of my favorite games coming from my first read through of that book. Oh, man, another gap in my knowledge. Um, do you think that one, Sam, would be a good candidate for this format or no? I think people will have legitimate quibbles regarding the analysis, but the 200-something games in the book are games that I feel like pretty much every chess player should know. So uh, I don't know if it's 
one of the greatest chess books, but it's one of the greatest games collections, I would say, and I would encourage everyone to find it if they can. Okay, and as always, we'll do extensive show notes and link to it um, where possible. By the way, there's been some issues lately with hyperlinks in the Perpetual Chess uh, descriptions. I always put them in as of this year, as of 2019. So if you're not seeing them, then there's some sort of issue. Uh, rumors are it's with Apple, Apple Podcasts. Um, but if you're not seeing them, you can always go to the website and the website will have the hyperlinks. But getting back to Mikhail Tall, um, I just wanted to also, I felt like we should we should always say what edition of the book we're reading, because a lot of you will have read these books, want to get them off your shelf. Maybe we'll have some quote that you're trying to track down. Uh, so, so Sam, um, what book, which version of, um, of this tall book did you use? So I read the book from Everyman Chess Classics. It has uh, revisions um, and editorial work by John Nunn. I think the translations come from Ken Neat. Um, it's based on a um, publication by RHM, the original publication. The publisher went under, but every man brought the book back, which is fantastic. So basically everyone involved in the production of the book is an amazing um, chess creator. Uh, and it, it really shows, I think, in all the detail in the work. Anything that John Nunn is involved in is fantastic. And it also mentioned... Um, the other books that you can check out in the Everyman Chess Classics include Kromnik's My Life in Games, which is amazing, also by uh, Domsky as a co-author. Um, I know that Magnus Carlsen has cited that book as like one of his favorites when he was growing up. The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Bronstein and Fire on Board by Alexei Shirov. And those are like the three other game collections that I remember reading in like high school and just loving, especially Shirov's Fire on Board. So... Every Man Chess Classics has had a big impact on my chess development, and I've really enjoyed the the books that I've read from them. Yeah, great books, and some of them, who knows, maybe maybe someday we'll be recapping those. But um, for for what version I had, I had the Every Man Kindle version, and all due respect to Every Man, as Sam said, we we love what they do. But unfortunately, sometimes the the Kindle versions can have some issues. I I generally I always gravitate towards for a chess or chessable or an ebook whenever possible because I live in a chaotic household with little children. So I, you know, I, I enjoyed the days where I could sit there with a chess book and read the prose, play through the moves, read the prose, play through the moves. But that's not really how things work for me now. So if I'm gonna get through as many books as I like to read, then I, I need to um I need to be able to read them on tablets or at least um it's easier. Um so yeah, unfortunately, there's some errors. Uh, the the um, the the presentation, the way it looks visually, the way the pages are presented, isn't amazing. So I, while I strongly recommend this book, I would say the Kindle version isn't ideal. What I ended up doing is, and also there's not a ton of diagrams, so I often would end up like having two devices where I would have one where I play through the moves, whether I find it on ChessGames.com. Um, or whatever the case may be, and uh, or just input the moves into like the, um, an analysis board, but or um, um, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, you guys get the idea. I use the Kindle version, um, but I think it's time to jump into the book. Um, so, Sam, I was thinking next up we should begin with the beginning. So, how does this book begin? Um, so I'm going to read uh, just the opening passage here, which I think is really good context. And I should probably set it up a little bit. Um, this book, um, aside from the, like the game annotations, is presented as an interview. And uh, the interviewer is not given in the book. Uh, it turns out to be Domsky. I've often actually heard that Tal himself played the interviewer, quote, a journalist, uh, but in looking up the information, it seems it was Domsky, and so that's actually a myth. Maybe others out there have heard that, I, too. I read that, too, yeah, and then I tried to track it down, and then I couldn't figure out where I read it. But, yeah, I mean, being that we know a journalist is the co-author, it would stand to reason that it, it's Domsky. But, sorry, yeah, go on. Or maybe a collaboration between Tal and Domsky. I, I don't really know, but I, I don't think it's true that the whole thing is by Tal. We know now that Domsky was involved. Um, but yeah, I've heard that a lot. Uh, I've heard that a lot. So in any case, uh, the book opening, which I think gives a really great flavor for the book, begins, a chess player, Mikhail Tal, 
And a journalist, it says, who knows, comma, perhaps alias. So right at the beginning, it kind of plays with the idea of who is this journalist. And the journalist asks, well, now, shall we begin? Did you think on first sitting down at the chessboard that you would at some time play a match for the world championship? Incidentally, what do you recall of your first game? And the chess player responds, did I think probably not. Matches for the world championship are fairly rare events, and from the physical point of view, it is simply not possible for many chess fans to take part in them. I say fans because, after all, even professionals are chess fans. But about my first game, when one of us first plays chess, he is like a man who has already caught a dose of microbes, of, say, Hong Kong flu. Such a man walks along the street, and he does not yet know that he is ill. He is healthy, he feels fine, but the microbes are doing their work. Something similar, though less harmful, occurs in chess. You have just been shown that the knight moves like the Russian letter ge, the bishop diagonally, the castle, no, the castle, not the rook, in a straight line, while the queen, once again, not the fiers, but the queen, likes her own color. You lose the first game, but at some time, if your father or elder brother or simply an old friend wants to be kind to you, then you win. And as a result, you feel very proud of yourself. A few days pass, and suddenly you involuntarily begin to sense that without chess, there is something missing in your life. Then you may rejoice. You belong to that group of people without a natural immunity to the chess disease. All right. So that's how the book opens. And there are a lot of things that I really like about that opening. But one thing that really connects with me is how accessible it is. I think that Tao in this opening manages to uh, connect with both experienced chess players and very, very new chess players. And you get the sense that, you know, someone who has just learned how to play chess can still read and enjoy kind of the colorful language and the honesty. He's speaking in a way that every chess player can appreciate, um, not in some kind of high-level analytical framework. So many game collections that can be great, um, are just the games with very brief notes, like, and then I played a match or something like that. But you don't get that at all here. The whole text kind of crackles with story and narrative and flair. Yeah, well said. And obviously, I mean, for me, it was a unique perspective, having heard so much about the book and, and then diving in. Um, but I didn't, um, I didn't know the, that the format would be this way. I mean, obviously... It's not totally unusual to have a format where you have basically a chapter of prose and then a chapter of games and you try to sort of tie them together as best uh, one can. But it was less the, the, the fake dialogue or perhaps real dialogue between uh, uh, Tal and the journalist. That part really kind of uh, caught me unaware reading it for the first time. I mean, it's, uh, it took some getting used to for me. But as you say, I mean, it, it's, it's very lively prose. Um, and you, Tal's personality really comes through. Um, I do have, there are a couple things I wish were a tiny bit different, but I mean, overall, and we'll, we'll get to those later, but overall, I mean, it's just like you're off to the races and he picks up. This is uh, one of the things I was actually alluding to is he picks up as like, he's already a great chess player. He doesn't, it's not one of these memoirs where it starts when he's a kid and he's introduced to the game. It's like you kind of, dive in and then you're you're on to the chess um anything to add sam well one thing i would like to say is i like the journalist um i don't know if it's like straight domsky or domsky and tall working together to fictionalize a journalist but i like that first question like did you know you would play a match for the world championship what do you recall of your first game uh it definitely feels to me kind of like a mainstream journalist, uh, you know, writing for, you know, press, not just chess press, but larger press, but a good journalist who's asking interesting questions that will um, interest a broad audience, and he's getting good answers back. So I really appreciated that, and I think that that shows up throughout the book. Um, I like that the way that the questions are presented um, isn't uh, coming from this kind of journalist who's just asking a chess player what the chess player wants to talk about. It's coming from a journalist who's asking, you know, what they think the audience would be interested in. Um, So I I connected with that personally. Um, Let me ask you, what did you think about that kind of artifice? You mentioned maybe being a little mixed on it, being surprised by it. Um, Did you think it kind of worked and it added something to the structure of the book? 
Yeah, it grew on me. I would say that when I when I jumped in, I was a little skeptical, and at first, I was like, "What well, you you know?" I just I like I'm I default towards uh, sort of a linear narrative. That's generally like what I'm most comfortable reading. But as the book went on, and as you say, that the questions are good. Um, so to the extent that I have any any quibbles with the book, this is not really one of them. It it took some getting used to, but I think it it works really well. Awesome. Um, so, moving on to the major themes of the book. Now, I, now that we've gotten the intro and the podcast intro and all that stuff out of the way, this is sort of the meat of uh, what we're here for. So, what would you say are the major themes of um, the life and games of Mikhail Tolson? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say, setting aside the chess for a moment, I would say storytelling is a big part of it. There are a lot of uh, stories in the book. A lot of them are very famous um, from both this book and from other uh, um, locations where these stories are retold. Um, the story of Mikhail Tal kind of thinking up a, a poem about uh, a hippopotamus being dragged out of a swamp and, yeah. and using it to structure his game is a famous story. Uh, the story that I really liked was one where his opponent, his eventual trainer, Koblenz, I don't think he was his trainer at the time, had missed a move and was about to forfeit on time because he was going to make 39 moves instead of 40 moves because his score sheet was wrong. And Tal corrected him. I just really liked that. And that was like the genesis of kind of their relationship. But those are just a couple of examples. There are stories throughout the book. Um, so the prose section um, is very story based. It's not just, you know, a retelling of I did this tournament, I got plus one, then plus two. There's some of that that's important as well, but I don't think that's the basis of the uh, the book. It's really a lot of stories. Um, the other things that I uh, think stand out are real passion for chess. Um, I think you're getting that in a lot of places. Obviously, just the games themselves, the way that Tao plays couldn't be described as anything other than passionate, I think. And there's other quotes that he mentions. I think he has to play like 100 games a year, which is a crazy amount. I, I might be getting that number wrong, but I remember being kind of taken aback by how many games he felt he needed to play in a year. And certainly the number of brilliancies he produced is a testament to his passion, um, as is uh, the book. Um, I think that you also just get a lot of the human side, in terms of particularly Tal's health, like Tal just always had health problems. And it comes through like right in the opening when he's describing like a youth tournament he's playing at and that he had to leave the tournament to go to the hospital. I think it might have been scarlet fever. I'm really not sure what it was. But he mentions like, unfortunately, this was not the first time or close to the first or not the last time or close to the last time in his career that he had to leave a tournament for the hospital. Um, famously, he had health issues in his rematch with Botvinnik, but they were just a constant throughout his career. And although he had an incredibly long career because he became world champion at such a young age, and then he had you know an extensive and really fantastic career after that, he still passed away at the age of only 55. Um, you know, decades at the top of chess. But I think his health really comes through as a part of the story, um, which is a bit sad, uh, but it's also very, very human. And I like that as well. Yeah. Health, love of chess, definitely two of the primary themes, themes of the book. Um, his, he's got a sense of humor. I mean, he's, he doesn't take himself too seriously, even, a, even as the world champion. Um, and even, and mostly when he's talking about his health issues, he's, he's very matter of fact about it. Um, he's not, He's not, uh, woe is me, this happened and that happened and I lost because of this. Um, he's generally, um, he just presents the facts as they occurred uh, with some whimsy um, and, of course, lots of game analysis. And what you say about stories is definitely um, a good point to bring up because uh, my general vision of a framework for uh, talking about these books is to have favorite quotes. But as you pointed out when we were sort of going back and forth on this one, uh, this one, it's more about stories. Like every favorite quote I highlighted was like more than a page long. 
So we'll see where yeah. the conversation we'll see where the conversation goes. Maybe we'll read one or two of them. But yeah, I mean, it's really just these these entire sequences of events that I definitely I, I would want to share because again, people who haven't read it can get a taste for the book, and uh, people who have like maybe this will jog your memory of some of some of the great things uh, that occurred in this book. Um, I, I do have a couple of. Uh like shorter paragraphs that I'd like to read. So they're not quite quotes, um, but they're not like full page stories. Um, so if we could jump. <laughs> yeah, those, go for it. If you're ready. I think that they're kind of fun, just fun little snippets. Um, so this one is the journalist asking Tao, quote, in the majority of cases, you decline when you are offered a draw. Do you take time to consider the suggestion or like a charger? Do you straight away snort defiance at the sound of the bugle? <laughs> right. And Tao responds, alas, that is what normally happens. I will even let you into a small trade secret. When I'm offered a draw around move 15, while the position is still flavorless and there is no real fight going on, then I'm more inclined to agree. But later, I more often decline. I, I just find both sides of that uh, really funny um, and really, really relatable. Throughout the book, I think that even the um, you know average... <laughs> or slightly better than average tournament player like ourselves can relate to the emotions in a thing like a draw offer. Like yeah. you get to hear a world champion talk about, no, I actually like respond in a certain emotional way when someone offers me a draw. Yeah. Right. And I really, really like that. And I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> and it definitely is something that occurs in my own games based on different contexts. And then this other very short paragraph was funny to me. The end of the year was crowded with, with events, but it began in an, un, in an unpleasant way. At the Olympiad in Havana, an unknown man caught me with a tactical blow, <laughs> a bottle to the head. As a result, the first game of the Olympiad, Tal versus NN, ended in my defeat, close to a rout. And I just like that, uh, that turn of phrase and just the story, like just dropping a paragraph in about being hit in the head with a bottle right, yeah. and losing the game Tal versus in in uh so that uh that cracked me up there's lots of other things like that maybe not uh as violent as that but uh lots of other great little bits throughout the uh book like that not quotes exactly but um definitely memorable pieces yeah and of course the the hippopotamus story i mean i think uh i'm guessing 50 percent of listeners will have heard this you it's all over the internet if you google like tall hippopotamus story it's a long one but basically he's thinking for 45 minutes and he's thinking about something totally unrelated to chess and everyone thinks it's uh you know oh what was he thinking what was he calculating and meanwhile he was just like off on this huge tangent and yeah i mean in that regard he's just so so relatable as compared to a lot of um legendary chess players and and what you were saying about uh this insight into what he's feeling a lot of that obviously filtered through to his chess i mean he had a very psychological approach to the game um which when we talk about games um i i think we'll we'll be discussing um some um one other thing i wanted to mention um was i think a good companion to this book um and i guess maybe um a good companion to this book is uh, Jenna Sasanko's uh, The World Champions I Knew. Um, it's because he he's right there. He was friendly with Tal and like lived with him and tells a lot of the stories that Tal maybe leaves out. I mean, because Tal was, of course, a legendary smoker and drinker. And I mean, the height of his fame is something that uh, I think is kind of hard to comprehend these days. I mean... Uh, he, him being followed and people like chanting his name uh, like from the ground when he's in his hotel room uh, after like during the, the 1960 match against or um, the match against Botvinnik. Um And uh, Sasanko obviously is an amazing writer and there's just so much more color about all the things that, that Tal kind of left out. But I mean, there's plenty in here as well. That's fantastic. I've, not had a chance to read that, and I'm going to be looking that up yeah, basically right after this. Ends. Yeah, you'll love it. You won't be able to put it down. Um, it's incredible, and it do definitely gives you a, a, I mean, not a shocking perspective, but just he's so unflinching. Um, and overall, obviously, it's a positive portrayal. But, I mean, uh, one memorable thing he says is that in between the World Championship matches, of course, Tal, legendarily after soundly beating Botvinnik to win the World Championship, loses it um, in 
uh, one calendar year later, I don't know what the exact timing was in terms of months. I don't know if you do, Sam, but, um, but I'm going to guess a year. I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty quick. Um, 60 and 61. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Sasanko has a quote from Tal's mom. And Tal, of course, in the book, he blames some health issues and he had some legitimate health issues leading up to the second world championship match. But he also just talks about how Tal was living in Moscow and just partying like crazy. Like after he won the first world championship, um, you know, just basically a socialite. I mean, obviously, you know, he he loved to read and he was obsessed with chess. So I don't think it was... Um, I don't think he wasn't he wasn't neglecting his chest per se. It's just he was one of these people who seemed to to have more hours to do things than other people. And he 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 took advantage of of his celebrity or enjoyed his celebrity to the fullest. But so he has a quote from um, Tal's mom saying, if we had just been able to keep him in prison in between the first world championship and the second world championship, he would have been able to retain his title. But uh, the the implication, obviously, being that. uh, all, all of the accoutrements got in the way. Um, Tal kind of denies that, but but uh, it's interesting food for thought. Uh, two interesting things that are probably should be mentioned relating to the World Championship is that a companion, another companion book that you should really get is Tal vs. Botvinnik 1960, um, Tal's famous book about the match. Uh, I didn't get to the chance to reread that before this, but that kind of sits there in this space and uh it really although it, in this particular book he does discuss the match um and then the rematch uh that book focuses in on the first 1960 world championship match so that's a huge companion and maybe a, a future book for this podcast series that, yeah. um yeah <laughs> uh the other thing that i thought was interesting is just that this was the last rematch i think that there's a lot of criticism of the rematch system um this is the last time it happens uh well i guess not quite but it's the last time botvinnik got a rematch through this system uh so in 1960 they had they had the world championship tal won and then a year later botvinnik got the rematch but he didn't get a rematch after that um they ended the system with botvinnik's win okay um so we've got basically four general themes that I'd like to hit as sort of the 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 format, and um, I think to keep, um, I think the next place best to go, Sam, is probably to the best game since we were just talking about the World Championship match. Um, we both have a few notes, jotted, excuse me, notes jotted down, um, but one that we we both uh, agreed on was uh, Game Six of Botvinnik versus Tall. Uh, 1960. So, what what is it that you like about that game? That and and of course, there's so many great tall games that are not even in the book. Um, I mean, the guy just played so much that even in this 500 page epic book, um, not every tall game that is my favorite tall game is is even in the book. But anyway, we both agree. I'm about not even sure six. if half of my favorite tall games yeah. are in the book. And there are a ton of games I love, and I love the games in here. But yes, there's a an extensive career that comes after this book because this book covers up through 1975 and there are just other bits um, that are great games that are celebrated games that aren't in here some that are in the world championship match that aren't included here or other things like that um yeah the the 1960 Bofinick versus Tal game with 16 knight f4 is i think one of the great games of all time and i don't think anyone's really going to debate that the move itself is one of the great chess moves of all time sound or unsound it's played on the highest stage in chess i think anything that happens at uh the world championship is obviously instantly um more epic and interesting and discuss the legacy and history uh, associated with any game played at the world championship is always going to be sizable. Um, and in this particular game, you get just an amazing example of the two players kind of in their essence competing and contrasting, right? You get, you know, the great Botfinick playing a good game, but then Tao, you know, comes up with some wizardry and a peace sacrifice that maybe you could refute you know, with an extensive amount of time to analyze it, but he quickly wins a fantastic game against Botvinnik, um, you know, who can't handle all the complications. Uh, I think the most famous quote associated with Mikhail Tal that I or probably anyone has heard is that you must take your opponent into a deep, dark forest where two plus two equals five. 
and the path leading out is only wide enough for one. And this is that game right there that he drops his knight into f4 and um, he just uh, embroils Botvinnik in tons of complications uh, and Botvinnik succumbs. Yeah. First of all, I mean, that quote is just so, so legendary. It's so, uh, it's so tall. I mean, and I've, you know, it's, it's so perfect. And absolutely. The, and the game six, uh, the game six, knight f4, I mean, it's just interesting to me on a few levels because number one, he's ahead one to nothing. He's black in this game. And it wasn't like a, you know, tall, tall had some, there were some vulnerabilities in Botvinnik's position, but it was not a position where a sacrifice was uh, preordained by any means. Um, kind of a kind of a bolt from the blue, and obviously in the computer age, as Sam was saying, we have we have better perspective on how sound or unsound the move was. It turns out, I mean, it's not, you know, it wasn't. I mean, objectively, I guess it's unsound. <laughs> like, <laughs> let, let's let's not mince Ish, words. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, Ta just didn't care, and it's not like he didn't hear the criticisms when he wrote this book, and you know, it was published in 1976. Um, that's just not his approach to chess. And as we talk about chess improvement, I mean, this will become clear. But I mean, he had an advantage on the clock, and you know, he was very good at playing on the clock. And you know, the, I love that the fact that he's ahead in the match doesn't mean, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna run the clock out. I'm just gonna play passive. Like, no, I'm gonna put the pressure on my opponent. And that's how he ended up winning the match soundly. So it's so um, symbolic. I mean, certainly this game is not unique in that regard for Tal. But the fact that, like Sam said, it's the biggest stage um, really speaks to uh, his spirit. I feel like um, another thing about the game is that you just get a sense that Tal is always um, going forward. And in this particular game, it's like his pieces have achieved a lot. They're really, really nice pieces. But how do they go forward any farther? And it turns out kind of the only way to go forward is just to sacrifice the knight on f4. So he goes for it. I can think of a lot of other games in the book. Um, Bir Brager versus Tal, a great queen sacrifice that's uh, really early in the book, one of uh, his young games. Um, Larson versus Tal 1965, or Tal versus Larson 1965, a candidates match where he drops a knight into d5 in the Sicilian. It's very speculative. And it just seems like I'm going forward. How can I go forward? And okay, if it's a peace sacrifice, it's a peace sacrifice, but I'm not slowing down. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many games, and the audio only format is not not the most conducive <laughs> to uh, recounting the games, but I will say Sam's got a couple great videos up on his YouTube channel. Um, uh, Tao Sweeten was a, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name from, I'm safe to say, I have I'm, no idea. Safe to say I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, but Alexi Sweeten, he wrote a book about the Roy Lopez, uh, very strong Soviet era grandmaster. Um, and of course there's the, there's the tall games with Fisher in 19, I mean, throughout time, but in 1959, he played a young Fisher, um, and actually managed to beat him in four straight games. And yeah, one of those games was one of the ones I was alluding to that I wish had been in there, but isn't. But I mean, he's got some great perspective on Fisher. Uh, there, there's just so much in terms of the games. And that's the part that I think is least conducive to uh, an audio podcast recap. So we'll just leave it at that. Oh, one other thing I did want to mention. I looked at Donner Tal, which is one of his most famous games, Donner Tal 1961. This was one of the only games I looked at where I just put the engine on just because I was curious. And it's, it's, it's an interesting experience. I mean, it's, there's very little correlation between his notes and the engine analysis. And to me, I don't, <laughs> to me, I don't think that detracts from the game at all. I don't think that attra- detracts from the book at all. But, I mean, it does show how things have changed and how people who love to argue about the Pantheon and all that stuff, I mean... You know, I think uh, if you put it in one of these, um, I actually haven't seen any studies about like the the work that Ken Regan does in terms of uh, and like cap scores that that you guys do over at chess.com. I don't know where Tal ranks at all time, but he doesn't strike me as as sound as some other players. Well, I mean, I think that he's always been shown to be a strong player. I think that the players in the um, 1950s era are often uh, in analysis through caps and uh, what Ken Regan has done. I'm um, shown to even be a step back from like Capablanca versus right. Yekin in terms of accuracy. Uh, so don't don't quote me on that, but I don't that think sounds, it's necessarily intuitive, the most intuitively. It sounds in right to me. Yeah, intuitively that sounds right. Um, yeah. So moving on to the next, or did you have well, something, Sam? 
I, I want to mention first off this that uh, my personal favorite game is Smyslav or Smyslav vs. Tal 1964, um, which is a game that features both a great uh, queen sacrifice from Tal and a really fantastic end game. So I just want to throw that one out there as a favorite. And I think that a format note that um, might be worth making real quick is that a lot of the games are given with full annotations. Um, but there's also a ton of fragments, uh, which I really liked as well, where um, he didn't bother to add notes in some cases um, or to give the full game, but he gave a lot of fragments. I think I read somewhere that there were like 100 games and 100 fragments, but I did not count, and that doesn't sound right. So I'm not sure, but there's there's definitely a lot of both there to uh, to be appreciated. Yeah, and given that we're already complaining about the number of games that, that aren't in the book, it's good that he yeah. is. It's good that he had some fragments in order to be able to include more. And um, another thing that's probably worth mentioning, because you mentioned the uh, looking at Donner versus Tal with a computer, is I think John Nunn does a great job kind of staying out of the way. Yes. He makes some corrections, but and he mentions it uh, in kind of uh, his in, his bit at the beginning of the book describing his approach. He tried not to, you know, stick his nose in too often and really – he wanted to let Tal's uh, annotation stands out, stand out. You do get some points where Tal says, actually, this position looks to be winning after this, but he doesn't do it too often. He mostly lets Tal's uh, annotation stay, and I really appreciated that kind of minimalistic approach from Nunn. I'm sure there are other cor- corrections he could have made, but I'm glad he didn't. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I agree. Um, let, let the words stand on their own. Um, chess improvement takeaways. So we're always going to try to synthesize um, those of you driving around in your car trying to get better at chess. We've got some blindfold, a couple blindfold puzzles that we're going to close with. But first, uh, this is not the in terms of uh, books that I'm likely to cover. This is not the easiest in terms of uh, improvement takeaways because it's kind of like don't try this at home sort of thing. But <laughs> but on the other hand, you kind of do have to try it at home. So so Sam, what what did you think? Uh, well, I have a follow-up question uh, relating to that, uh, but I I personally think that the um, best way to improve at chess is to enjoy chess. Uh, so from that perspective, I think that there's just a ton of value because I think anyone who's reading through this book is going to be inspired, is probably going to be playing more and studying more. So I, I do value that. I think that this is an important part of it the diet for a chess player like you can't always be reading Dvoretsky's in-game manual as great as it is Um, but also in general I think that anyone who's reading a game collection who does take the time to ask questions um, you know when you're reading it don't just um, kind of blindly read the notations and go oh black was better here or white was better here you know ask like what about that move it seems like that move could definitely have been played you know, try to find the refutation that the book's not giving or uh, find out why it's a strategic error. If you don't see it, plug it into a computer. Um, you know, try to set up the book on a board or, okay, like, I don't know who's actually setting it up on a board anymore. Get a, yeah. get the game from chess games or something like that, right? Yeah. It's just going to be easier. But, you know, you can go through the game and you'll get a lot more out of it. Um, I think that in terms of reading chess books, um, you don't want to bog yourself down. Don't think, oh, I have to play through every single game, right? If you don't have the time to do that, you're still going to benefit from just reading it and enjoying it. If you have more time to put in and you want to make it a training thing, then slowing down and really getting introspective, making notes will definitely uh, benefit uh, you and will really improve your chess, I think. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a like study contest. It's, you know, it, the the object is to enjoy what you're doing. Um, presumably, you're not a professional if you're, you're listening to this. Um, and to get better when you can. Um, in terms of, a, you have something to say, Sam? Well, I just wanted to follow up on the uh, don't try this at home comment you mentioned. And I just wanted to ask, um, have you ever tried this at home? Like, is there a game or some games where you've been like, I'm going to try to play like Tal in this tournament, or I'm feeling Tal inspired or something. And (laughs) you were like, I'm sacking this piece. This piece is going down. I'm not sure, but we're going for it. Not explicitly, but I mean, I've made one or two what I would call... um, more intuitive sacrifices where, you know, I'm just like YOLO and I sa- sacrifice the yeah. piece. So, I mean, certainly that's, uh, that's inspired by, by Tal, but, 
but I haven't had the ex- I haven't made the explicit connection. But I mean, yeah, I shouldn't have said don't try this at home because I really think I mean, if it suits your style, if you're an attacking player, I think that most I mean, the, when you look at this game, when you think about the legends he's playing and the pressure he's putting them under, um, mm-hmm. you probably should take it at home. I mean, you guys, whoever's listening, you're not playing Botvinnik, you know, and he made him sweat, you know, so um if something can be refuted in two moves, don't play it. But if it leads to to murky waters where your opponent's going to be less comfortable than you, um, that's uh, that's a, an avenue you might want to pursue. Um, which is, I love that you described his style as YOLO. By the way. <laughs> I mean, that was his whole life for you know beyond the chessboard. I mean, uh, someone. Uh, I mean, many people I'm sure have said, but he played how he lived. You know, I mean, he he just pedal to the metal at all times um just living living and playing to the fullest um a quote from yuri averbach about tal uh is that tal never grew up he was always a child he burned his candle at both ends um, yeah just exactly. to follow up on the yolo style yeah and like right um there. you know he had to have caretakers basically i mean um sasanko in the book talks about how bad he was with money like he just didn't care he just had it and he spent it and then he would go broke and of course there when he was at the height of his powers he was he was rich but just money was just he didn't even think about it you know it's just it's just to acquire what he wants at that moment you know um which is also how he treated his chess games um so yeah, I, I mean, improvement takes away takeaways. Uh, it kind of ties in sacrificing material for time and initiative. Obviously, is a major theme of his games. Um, play in a way that suits your styles. I love the openings. Um, you like Sicilians, Kings Indians, Benonis. I mean, it's just it's uh it's it's inspiring. I mean, not everyone plays that style, and then then it wouldn't be inspiring. But but finding openings that that get you excited, I would say. Yeah, I um I've been really inspired by his Benoni. There's a lot of great Benonis in here. There are other great Benonis that he played that aren't in here, but the Benoni's been a part of my repertoire. Um almost everything has been a part of my repertoire, but when I play the Benoni, like I'm thinking of Tal. Um and I'm thinking often of specific games from this book uh and his great dark square attacks. I'd also say practicality and time management. Like there's a bit of an anecdote where he describes where he actually flagged on time once and he's like and i never did that again right and boy do i wish i could say yeah that. exactly uh, that's yeah. not true of me and in fact when i try to play like tal like i'm inspired by this book sheriff's fire on board is one of my great inspirations i love this style of play but i've just never been able to really do it and basically whenever i try it what happens is i burn all my time and can't find a win and then i just lose on time yeah yeah it's hard it's it's hard to just let it fly i mean it's one yeah. thing to have the idea, but at some point, I mean, and there are, there are definitely moments in the book where he just says, you know, I just didn't calculate that much. <laughs> like, you know, you just, <laughs> just just play. And he, you know, obviously legendary blitz player, um, you know, um, beat Kasparov. Uh, what's the famous story about uh, came straight from the hospital, like one of one of his last tournaments. Like he he came and we played Kasparov and beat him in a blitz tournament, um, like in, in his last years i'm fuzzy on the details but you <laughs> you get the idea uh and and that's another thing that sasanko talks about is he just played i mean again this is not about the sasanko book but again it's a it, it's a nice um nice compliment and he just played so much i mean it, he was playing blitz all night i mean reading books when he's not playing i mean it's just uh he just lived the life and obviously if you want to improve the more time you put in the better it will be uh for your chess, possibly not for your life, but, <laughs> but at least for your chess. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, two more uh, little subsections. Um, we've kind of touched on this, but I mean, if if you were to compare this to sort of a litany of other books, Sam, and chess improvement is your your primary goal. How how useful do you think this book is? If chess improvement is your primary goal, I would say most game collections probably aren't at the top of the list unless you're taking reading them really seriously, as mentioned uh, a moment ago. I mean, I think that number one is you know honing your tactics. Uh, number two, maybe in games, um, because you know that that knowledge is going to help you out in your game if you get the positions that apply. And I mean, you know, people always say don't burn your time on openings, but that knowledge is valuable too. Game collections. I think a collection, uh, I think a knowledge of master games is just really, really important. 
any one game collection probably has less um, value in terms of just raw ELO points gained than a great tactics book or end game book or even opening book if you're you know really honing your repertoire. But you need to build your knowledge of uh, of master games, and this is one that I think really should be in uh, everyone's library. and uh, And I'd really encourage everyone to read it um, at some point. Yeah, uh, well said. I agree. I don't. I don't really have um, anything to add. I mean, it's yeah. It's you'll get better at chess, but it's probably not the one hundred percent greatest bang for your buck if that's your sole objective. Um, although it's inspiring, which you know that's hard. It's hard to put that in a formula. You know, how um, important is getting better at chess? Really, like we're not going to be Magnus Carlsen. Apologies to the re- listeners out there. Maybe someone out there will be a world champion. There probably are listeners who will be a world champion. But most of us, like the number one thing I think is enjoying chess. Right? Yeah. The, only like what the top twenty can make a living through raw chess skill. So for the rest of us. I think enjoying chess is even more important than improving at chess, and uh, I can't recommend another book above this one in terms of raw chess enjoyment. Excellent, excellent. Although that does uh, bring us to, um, basically, we have two more things, quibbles with the book, and then we'll hit a couple blindfold chess problems and let you guys go. So do you do you have any quibbles with the book, Sam? I know it's one of your favorites. Um, <laughs> I tend not to quibble too much with books that I like. Uh, I do wish sometimes that uh, some of the games that are given as fragments or that aren't even in the book had been analyzed. I think if I were doing the collection of games that were getting uh, all the notes, <laughs> I might have done a different collection of games uh, in there. Um, so that's maybe one thing. In terms of the pros, I really don't have any complaints because I feel like I'm getting as much of Tal as I can. There are a few anecdotes from Tal's career that aren't in here that are in other sources and I'd love to have had Tal's perspective. So it's mostly just omissions, but how much can you really complain about omissions when it's 500 pages Yeah, long? that's a good and point. I really am enjoying the content that is there. I also wanted to mention that, you know, it's sad that the book ends in 75 because Tal played so many great games after 1975. Um, like... My personal favorite game, Tal vs. Fleisch, was played in 1981. It was the best game in Informant Magazine. Um, but th- there's so many other games that you can find and as you've well. You've got a video about that one too, right, Sam? I did do a video about that one recently because I, I was just thinking about it re- um, relating to reading this book again. I yeah. was like, i got to do a video about that because um, I just enjoy the game so much and I wanted to share it. I think it's actually a little less known than some other games. Um, but also... Uh, there, there is actually a sort of sequel, and I didn't even know this until about an hour before this um, as I was looking over some notes, and it is Joe Gallagher's The Magic of Mikhail Tal, um, which is a book about Tal's games that I had heard of, but I didn't realize that what Gallagher does is he picks up in 75. So that book is a really good companion. Um, I actually had it in my collection, and I just hadn't been able to read it. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. I was skimming through it before we did this interview, and so for those people who have read this book or will read this book, hopefully, and are like, what's happening after 75? I need to see those games. Uh, Joe Gallagher's The Magic of Mikhail Tal is a great book to get a hold of. I think it's very accessible on Amazon and other places, and you can fill in all those great games that come after 1975. Mm -hmm. Good to know. I didn't know that either. And of course, I'm, I think basically everyone listening can identify to having a chess book in their library that they haven't looked at. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I've got more than a few. Yeah, exactly. Um, and my quibbles, again, it kind of falls under the same umbrella where it's kind of hard to complain about a 500 page book missing something you would like. But I mean, I do love the personal side. I mean, he, you know, he was married three times. Um, Sasanko talks a lot about the women in his life. I mean, that would have been interesting to read about or a a parallel book where you read about that um, might have been interesting. Um, So just a little more personal reflection just because he's such a fascinating character. But I mean, really, they're they're just quibbles. I mean, you can't go wrong reading this book. And uh, Sam, as you mentioned in the book, the lack of an uh, e-book. Everyman, I think think you guys would sell some books. So 
um, get it on forward chess, get it on chessable. Uh, they actually have a reader that's pretty cool. And at first, I, I as we were researching this, I, I checked out the reader to make sure they don't have their book. Their reader looks pretty nice, which I wasn't familiar with. But the Magic of Mikhail Tal, I don't believe is available there. Apologies if I'm wrong, but I didn't see it. But that's the last quibble, uh, just because these days it, it's such a nice way to go over a game and it's often more practical. Um, it's uh, mentioning... Um Tao's uh, relationships. I have not read this book, but I have been hearing, uh, oh, like I within see. the last year or very recently, uh, I think Tao's ex-wife, his first published, wife, yeah, his first wife published a memoir of like their life together. Um, I, I just don't know enough about it, and I hadn't been able to get a hold of it, but I've been hearing a lot of buzz, so that um, may fill in some blanks for readers who are looking for that. Um, and maybe another note there, actually. This is another quibble that I have is this was published in 75. So it's published, you know, um, maybe not the height of the Soviet Union, but certainly in a period in which what you said was monitored. And there is nothing relating to Soviet life in the book, really, I think. Um, Well, maybe a bit here or there, but you never get a sense of like uh, how living in the Soviet Union affected Tal's life and his outlook and – really what the Soviet chess school was like for him, what that whole environment was like. Uh, And I I do feel like that's kind of something missing. That's a perspective that I want that it obviously, it obviously makes sense that you can't really have that, but for other kind of peers of Tal's who were blessed to live longer, like uh, David Bronstein, you did get some of that after um, Glasnost and after the fall of the Soviet Union, he wrote about that life, and there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And I kind of feel like that's missing from this uh, this work. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah, and and the book you're referring to, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the title. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's by Sally Lando was his first wife, and it's published by Elk and Ruby. And I know Magnus Carlson, um, they they gave him a copy, and he said he he like read it in a day and could have put couldn't put it down. So if you want the personal. Oh, wow want the personal perspective on Tal, um, uh, I, it's probably a good way to go as well. Okay. I feel like this podcast is going to make a massive dent in your listeners' pocketbooks. <laughs> You've mentioned quite a few books at this yeah, point. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how we roll. I, ho- I, hope yeah. pe- <laughs> I hope people have learned to, um, I mean, either found their local... I mean, the other... <laughs> I don't know. I'm torn because I want, I want chess writers... I mean, there's so many great books. I want them to be supported. But on the other hand, you know, you you could go to a library, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, just just be mindful of um, of reading what you buy, as we were alluding to before. If it's an issue, I mean, if it's not, then by all means support these people. Hopefully, you'll get to the book sometime. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of a lot of um, potential follow ups to this. Um, so before I let you go, I think Sam, that's about it for the book do you have any like closing things i feel like we've pretty much covered it uh i do not i feel like we've run over but i've really really enjoyed this this is a great conversation for me just in terms of really enjoying to get to talk to you and i hope that people have liked it okay sam and i think you did great of course as i knew you would so no no surprise there and listeners um this is the part where i just uh, I, I, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts where they ask for feedback. I genuinely, especially for this, I, I would like feedback. If you love it and can't get enough of it, that's important for me to know. Um, or if it's really, you, I, we should stick to interviews. I, I can handle that criticism as well. Um, so whatever you think of it, let me know if it, if you really love it and you want to support the podcast, that makes a difference. Like I, like I said, I'm going to try to, uh, pay um my co-hosts the people who help me with this they're going to be putting time in so i feel that people should be rewarded for doing such things um so any any bit of support um via patreon or paypal like small amounts make a big difference because there's a decent amount of people listening to these podcasts so it makes a big difference i won't be uh won't be belaboring that point that often but just something to keep in mind guys i forgot to have sam give his contact info but here it is he's sam copeland on chess.com that's easy enough and from there you can find links to his twitter his twitch his youtube channel definitely recommend you check out his youtube channel and his blog on chess.com as well great content on both of them i also want to thank sam again for helping me out with this project he clearly went above and beyond what could be expected in terms of preparation for this. Um, a couple of other housekeeping notes before we leave you. 
with two blindfold puzzles. Uh, number one, the plan for perpetual chess, chess books recaptured for the foreseeable future is to do one per month and to leave it on the same podcast feed as the regular perpetual chess interviews. It'll be a bonus pod, so it's additional content. It's not going to replace the interviews that I'm already doing. Uh, number two, if you're interested in finding out more about this project, the landing spot for information about it is going to be perpetualchesspod.com slash recaptured. Of course, I'll link to that in the show description. On that page, I'll have a link for the list of books I currently have that I've thought of as potential good topics to recap here. They include Dvoretsky books, tournament books, lots of chess memoirs, kind of general chess improvement books, you name it. Um, there'll also be an online form if you'd like to apply to be a guest co-host. You just submit your name, a paragraph about about yourself, um, and a few of the books you would most like to talk about. Um, the two most important things I'm looking for in a co-host are enthusiasm and willingness to prepare. So once again, it's perpetualchesspod.com slash recaptured. Um, on to the blindfold puzzles. Uh, the idea of these puzzles is for one to be about 1400 level, one about 2000. Um, I could be off on these estimates. And those estimates are like if you're a 1400 over the board player, that means this puzzle is going to be easier if you were looking at a board, but you're not. So anyway, you get the idea. Um, I won't say the answers to the puzzles here. To get the answers, click on the link in the show description, and that'll take you right to a diagram with the answer. Um, I'll also list the piece placement without a diagram in the show description if you need to refresh your memory. Um, excuse me for a sec. Okay, so with that, please pull your cars over or slow down the treadmill. Here comes blindfold puzzle number one, the easier of the two. I'm guessing about 1400 level. This one was adopted from uh, I am Kostya Kovyutsky, friend of Perpetual Chess and uh, and guest of Perpetual Chess. Um, he's been sharing some cool blindfold puzzles on his Twitter feed, and this one I took and tweaked. So here's this puzzle. Uh, it is white to move and win, and here's the piece placement. Uh, we have a white king on f4, a white rook on c5, and a white pawn on b6. Black has a pawn on b2 and a black king on a6. That's it for the pieces. I'll give them to you one more time. White king on f4, white rook on c5, white pawn on b6. Black has a pawn on b2 and a black king on a6. And that one was white to move and win. Number two is white to move and mate in two. And I took this puzzle from one of the steps books. They have some cool blindfold stuff in there. This was actually a regular puzzle of theirs from step four. Uh, so white to move and mate in two. Here comes the piece placement. White queen on b5. White knight on f5. White king on c1. Black just has a king on c3. So I'll repeat the piece placement one more time. White queen on b5. White knight on f5. White king on c1. And black just has a king on c3. Okay, good luck with the puzzles and thanks for listening, everyone. I will catch you guys soon. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. The ways to do so include writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform, telling a friend, spreading the word on social media. All of that stuff helps. But most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. So I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, my PayPal and Patreon Perpetual Chess Partners. Here we go. They are extra special thanks to Chessable.com and Quality Chess Books and the Capital City Chess Club, Apprent Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Cow, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natal, Greg Shahadi, Guvin Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Duray, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Can, my main man, Moonmaster9000, 
Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan, Todd Kennedy, and I'd also like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Tarakov, Andrew Perry, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalicki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of US Chess, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, CEO of Chessable.com, Daylin Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Donnie Ariel, who may be an IM elect or maybe just has the titles, and I'm not sure if that makes him an IM elect, but thank you, Donnie, anyway. Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vanderveld, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Onfang. Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Zlosnik, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Reifort, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi. Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Swanee, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William H. Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I will catch you all next week.